Thank you very much. In fact, what I'm going to do today is give an overview of what's been happening in the islands and our key research questions. My own involvement is continuing the British School's work on the island of Ithaca, where we've been directing survey and a publication programme as well, and on Meganisi. So I'm very happy to answer more specific questions as well as the, the general overview material. The central Ionian Islands, uh, an archipelago framed by Kefalunia on the south, left Kars in the north, lie off the coast of Akanenia, with southern Kefalunia forming a bridge, as you see, down into the Peloponnese. The group, which also includes Ithaca and Meganisi, and then the smaller Athokos, Okuzi, Kalamos, Kastos, and many, many tiny islands, almost too small to fit on there, is uh, a distinctive chain within the broader Ionian island chain. To the north, Kekira, Paxi, and Antipaxi formed a separate network with its own material culture, connections into Epirus and the Adriatic, and indeed a different political history. Kekira and Lefkas were both Corinthian colonies, but at least from the 5th century onwards, their attitudes to their mother city more often divided than united them. Zakynthos to the south was in contact especially with southern Kefalonia, but had a more direct relationship down into the western Peloponnese. Now, in their different ways, both Kekira and Zakynthos were associated with the central archipelago, more so in some periods than in others, but the connection in general is a little looser. So today, I'm going to focus on this central group because it does form a very distinct island cosmos. The group may be less well known than, say, the, the Cyclades, but it's extremely interesting for its composition a mix of large and small islands with contrasting environments, population dynamics, and relations to each other and to the mainland, as well as for its broad strategic position and international connections. For such a very compact group, it's one of the most complicated and varied situations in the entire Mediterranean. Throughout antiquity, the islands were a strategically important hub, and they variously served as stations on sea routes between the Peloponnese central and northwestern Greece, and southern Italy. They lie on the eastern edge of intense Italian connections, the Adriatic routes linking across to Otranto, of which Kekira and Lefkas form part, plus direct routes to the area of Sybaris and round to the Bay of Naples. The Italian perspective is plain in the struggles which led to Roman control, beginning with the subjugation of Kefalonia in 189 to 8 BC, as well as what is now emerging as a very distinctive Western coastal pattern of Romanization. But it's clear, as we'll see, that it dates back much earlier. At the same time, the islands are on the western fringes of the old Greek polis world, with connections demonstrated in different ways in different areas and time periods. To take but three examples, the earliest known example of a Chian local script, which is itself a kind of fusion of traits culled from other region scripts all the way around the Corinthian Gulf is an inscription of around 700 BC found at Iatos on Ithaca and apparently referring to guest friendship. And the pottery assemblage from that site does indeed include many Peloponnesian imports. Secondly, a more direct political relationship is seen in the Corinthian colonization of Lefkas in the late seventh century, following upon that of Kekira around 725. Now, in fact, some scholars have, all on, have argued that the entire city-state network all the way down the Acarnanian coast was due to Corinthian in intervention. But Lefkas and Anactorium in southern Epirus apart, there are simply too many problems with the sources and the late, consistently fourth century date of this development for this argument really to work. Lefkas is the only secure colony in our area, and its role in consolidating the trading potential of the area echoes Corinth's foundation of Ambrakia, modern Arta, which controlled the inland river routes. Thirdly, in the later 5th and early 4th century, Athenian intervention on Kefalonia had a direct effect on the physical development of certain settlements and a wider impact on relations within the network, as we'll see. And then the northwestern context is important, since Lefkas at least was physically linked to Akarnania after, and after colonization relied upon its Perea to secure the great harbor works of the city the city, in fact, stretches out along the area of modern building on the south coast, so you can see how important the Perea is. And it became the seat of the Acarnanian uh, Kinon, the Confederacy, after 230. 
through its economic development, helping to create a market for the produce of other islands in the chain as well. So in short, in their settlement history and external relations, the central Ionian islands are neither colonial nor part of the Aegean milieu, but they're not simply a contact zone. They'd already begun to operate as a distinctive network before the development of the great federal states of the Hellenistic and later West, i.e. from the fourth century BC onwards. They helped to define these states and they responded and reacted to their presence and policies. So let's take a look at the islands individually. Kevolonia, at almost 800 square kilometers, is the largest of the Ionian islands. It's in fact a big island by Greek standards. It's mountainous, especially in the north and east, with plains covering only some 15% of its area, chiefly in the south and west, and less than a quarter of its overall area suitable for arable. It is, however, highly fertile, and its mountains, Inos in the south in particular, a major source of pine for shipbuilding and construction. Kefalonia supported four city-states, each with their own distinctive settlement histories. Sami and Proni, modern Poros, in the southeast, Krani in the area of modern Agostoli, and Pale, all with good harbours. There's little evidence of settlement in the mountainous centre of the island, from modern Aya Ithemia upwards, until the late classical period at the very earliest, and settlement even further north, notably at ancient Panamos, modern Fiscado, is essentially a Roman introduction. Kefalonia's eastern neighbour, Ithaki, is at just over a tenth of the size, a small rocky island with arable resources which are either very restricted or hard to defend. Data of all periods up to the devastating 1953 earthquake, which changed the pattern of rural settlement, reveal two basic responses a small resident population and the export of manpower for maritime activity and or cultivation abroad, including to the neighboring island chains and the Acarnanian coast, or intense ex intensive exploitation sustained by cash cropping for an external market. With no significant internal buffer, population levels responded to external changes with unusually sharp fluctuations. And this is something we now recognize as a particular small island phenomenon. Survey data from Ithaki in comparison with Kefalonia are very similar to those from Antikythera in comparison with Kythera, for example, just to give another Aegean case, although Ithaki is the more complicated case. There's also, as you see, a marked north-south divide. The island is physically articulated around an isthmus, and there's a big contrast in topography, with smaller but visually connected pockets of cultivable land in the north whereas the south has a larger but more confined plain. Ancient sources treat Ithaki as a single polis, yet with rare gaps there were always two population centres with their own external connections and internal organisation. In the south, Aetos is the only site with long-distance visibility, this is the view from the Acropolis, along the west coast and across the channel to the eastern cities of Kefalonia. It has, as you see, a clear sightline to Polis Bay in the north, and it's effectively just across the pond from Sami. In the north, the balance of settlement shifted along sight lines. Much depended on the balance of interests and connections between Kefalonia, Lefkas, and Akanania. Given this geography, two separate polis could easily have formed. There must have been powerful local factors, such as land inheritance and its marriage patterns, favoring separation. Conversely, there are security and economic advantages in close communication, both within the island and with the opposite sides of the surrounding straits. And the most obvious unifying factor is the long coastal connection with Kefalonia. Considering site location in terms of elevation, transport routes and accessibility, the west, where north-south visibility can be combined with defensive positions and access both to harbours and cultivable land, was consistently favoured. The east is much more rugged and with fewer sight lines. Of Ithaca's harbours, Vathi can accommodate a deep water fleet, but it's secured, secluded and marshy. Uh, this is the high water table in a late Roman complex excavated just two blocks from the modern coastline. It's marsh. But there's, and there's a little evidence of archaic to Hellenistic settlement here and on the surrounding hills but basically opportunities for excavation in the historic town have been few. What we know tends to be Roman. 
Polis Bay is shallower and more exposed, but much easier of access. The community at Ayatos used the anchorage at Piso Ayatos on the west coast, and possibly also its counterpart in the east. In the northeast, Kioni is equally hard to protect. Unless you control that ridge, the harbour is just hopelessly vulnerable. And further north still, Frikes, likely an important eastern anchorage in most periods, is very vulnerable to bad weather and flooding. The east-west distinction is important not only in terms of local development, but because when the Lefkas Canal was closed and shipping went around the west coast of Lefkas, the best route south was indeed straight down through the Ithaca Channel. Moving north to Lefkas, the coastal plain focuses in the east and south. The west coast is mountainous, and the centre of the island consists of mountain and uplands intensively exploited at various points in the island's history. After colonisation, settlement focused along the east coast in the area of the, the capital, the Hora, which seems to have been a new creation, and then south around Nidri, uh, ancient Elomenon, framing the channel and in contact with the Perea opposite. A second, second settlement centre, of which little is known, ancient Fara, is supposed to lie near the Vasiliki Plain, and the island's main sanctuary of Apollo Lefkata, excavated by Wilhelm Dubfeld last century, is on Cape Ducato, the southernmost tip of the island. It's unclear when the cult began, though poets from Anacreon onwards comment on it, in fact, as the traditional place of suicide. This is Sappho's leap, and uh, it's a very dramatic one. This second focus is again related to sea lanes down to Kefalinia in Dithaki, from which, as you see, southern Lefkas is clearly visible. Of the smaller islands, Meganisi currently supports the largest overwintering population, just over 1,000, mostly centred on the northern plains around Spathokhori and Vathi, with Nidri as the closest service centre. The slim southern leg is now almost deserted and very hard to access, but in antiquity, the reverse was true. The recent University of Crete survey found some 11 post-prehistoric ancient sites, all but three of which are on this leg. Mili, as you see here in particular, was more or less continuously occupied from the Bronze Age to late Roman times. It faces out towards the Acarnanian coast, and its material culture is directly linked to the mainland, not back out towards the islands. The other two largish but rather rugged islands, which currently support permanent populations, are Castos and Calamos, ancient Carnos. The rest are either privately owned or are goat islands. And these were used mainly by Ithacesians and Lefkathans for seasonal pasture and even cultivation in the 18th and 19th centuries. So there's a recent model of intense exploitation. And thanks to the brilliant work of the Ithacesian historian, Yanis Vlasopoulos, on the Venetian period port records, we have a very clear view of the nature and intensity of movement between the islands through the 18th century. During that century, there were over 100 Ithacesian crafts dedicated simply to movement within the archipelago alone, not even long distance trade. Uh, and certainly in survey, as you see, we found very, very intense uh, occupation activity. All this adds up to an unusually complex network of interactions. Our knowledge of the region's archaeology is also now enriched following many decades of reliance on the pioneering 19th and early 20th century work of Wilhelm Dirtfeld on Lefkas, Walter Hurtley and Sylvia Benton on Ithaca and beyond, and uh, Nicolas Kiparisis and Spirit on Marinatus on Kefalonia. There's been a very sharp growth in rescue archaeology following the establishment of ephoreas of prehistoric and classical antiquities in Agostoli, Preveza, in Missolonghi from 2003 onwards and a growing corpus of data from intensive surveys on Zakynthos, Keflania, Northern Ithaca, Meganissi, the Playa Peninsula, and for comparison, I've also added um, Nicopolis and Strati uh, Stratiki. Sorry about the crude slide, but it gives you a notion of the sheer extent of the area that's been walked in one form or another uh, over the last 15 years, as well as extensive prospection on Keflania and Lefkas. My focus today is on the historical, archaic to late Roman periods, but change is evident right across the board. The sheer quantity of new Paleolithic material, for example, is quite extraordinary. So all this makes the continuing hom Homeric focus of the popular presentation of Ionian archaeology, forgive me, but just a little bit frustrating. Excavation on Ithaca has been guided by it, 
Dirk Felt II approached Lefkas through this filter, and pretty well every major late Bronze Age discovery in Keflonia is greeted as the palace. Uh, here you see a site that's um, uh, up on the uh, Catavellata Hill, just outside Poros, which probably relates to the Zanata Tholos dug in the 1990s, which is currently being touted as the palace. It's a nice site, but uh, we don't know much about it yet. Even though not since Moses Finley in the late 1950s have historians actually considered Homer's Greece purely Mycenaean, it still recurs. By contrast, Homer enters our discussion today only in respect of the role played by the Ithacesian reception of Odysseus within a constructed island identity. On present evidence, this is first attested late in the 4th century on the island's coinage and was plainly important by the late 3rd century when the Ithacesian reply of around about 208 BC to an embassy sent by Magnesia on the Meander to request recognition of the state and her festival of Artemis included the offer of Proedria at the Odyssea, usually interpreted as a festival, and the instruction that the response be displayed in the Odysseum, probably, uh, as I'll argue, the Polis cave shrine. I'll return to this inscription later on. Odysseus's name first appears in a dedicatory inscription on an Artemis figurina, a protome of the 2nd or 1st century BC, from the Polis cave. As we'll see, this chronology fits an assertion, assertion of Ithacesian political identity as part of a sequence of local identity statements by communities right across Kefalonia to Lefkas, which began on Kefalonia in the 6th century and quickened in pace and intensity with the marked westward shift in wider Greek political interests from the time of the Peloponnesian Wars onwards. Odysseus was just a local strand in this, not an overarching regional figure. Other prominent local stories are entirely disconnected. Thus, Ferrakides, writing in the 6th century, derives the name of Kefalonia from Kephalus, who was rewarded with the island, then called Sami, for helping Amphitryon of Mycenae in a war against the Taphians and Teleboans, a story which reinforces cultural connections with Athens. So against this background, I'd like to explore three successive periods, the early Iron Age, about 1000 BC to give or take 700, collapse of the palaces to the early city-states, the classical and Hellenistic periods when we're getting the big federations forming, and then Rome and looking at the imposition of an external empire to see how and where major changes occurred and their subsequent impact across the chain. During the early Iron Age, attention focuses on Iatos as the only extensively excavated site in the archipelago and the only major early Iron Age settlement yet known on Ithaca. It's a rare period in Ithacesian history when settlement seems to have been concentrated in the south of the island. And in fact, Iatos may be the only site with a continuous record from Mycenaean to Imperial Roman times. From 1931 to 1934, and again in 1938, the so-called Cairns area was investigated by the British school. More of the lower city, including geometric housing, has since been uncovered by a team from Washington University. But Ayatos's apparent prominence could just be a matter of chance. Eighth century evidence has been found in trials at all four of the future Kefalonian polis centers, notably Sami, just over the water from Ayatos, and closely linked to it over the next century. But earlier finds are few. Of the major late and sub Mycenaean sites, only Kokolata Junction just extends into protogeometric, and then there's a little pro late protogeometric pottery from Sami and 9th century from Krani. Now, given the very limited extent of excavation, it's possible that Ayatos will come to be understood as just one of a group of local centres, if, I think, almost certainly a very prominent one. The early Iron Age architectural remains in the Cairns area can convincingly be reconstructed into a sequence of longhouses. The ceramic record is dominated by local products throughout, with a liberally adapted Corinthianizing style current in the 8th century, though probably no more actual Corinthian imports than Achaean or Western Peloponnesian, spanning the Gulf Zone and mirroring the connections implied by the local use of Achaean script. During the 8th century, exports of Ithacesian pottery indicate wide connections. In Italy, it appeared around the Bay of Naples as far north as Satricum, it went along the Corinthian Gulf to Perahora, 
and in Ypres it's found inland at Vitsa, probably reflecting wider trade up the main river valleys, and on the coast at Mavramandilia, opposite Kekira, where connections are also seen after the uh, colony's foundation. The Ayatos elite mark their status by dedicating, at a shrine within the settlement, luxury and especially metal objects like any good Western aristocrat. Personal ornaments show stylistic connections from northwest Greece to the eastern Aegean and Crete, and the quantity of amber in particular suggests trade connections with southern Italy. A tripod leg mold, as you see bottom right, found in the Washington University excavations, indicates that monumental bronze, bronze vessels were made locally, and terracotta imitations are also attested. By the late 8th century, the Iotos votive deposits contained ritual paraphernalia distinctive for the vessel shapes represented, canoy stands and light holders, for example, as well as for their painted and plastic iconography. A small but eclectic collection of human images links closely to the Bay of Naples, drawing as heavily on Near Eastern and Italian iconography as on mostly Corinthian Greek. It suggests that the Aetos elite used an international language of status, even when images were not strictly appropriate to the island. For example, a chariot procession on this Ithacusian figured Cantharos in the San Montano Cemetery at Pithecusae sits poorly with Homer's description of Ithaca as a rugged island not fit for driving horses. Well, it could be a Pithecusian commission, but it's more likely, I think, <coughs> to reflect widely held values, since the context of the Homeric reference is Telemachus's apology for not being able to accept a gift of horses, which was so obviously a desirable present. He's just got nowhere to put it. And we find horses depicted on other vessels too, on a Pixis from Iotos, with its robed processional and confronted figures and side saddle male rider. The cultural reference via which elite status was expressed during the second half of the eighth century uh, and indeed the early seventh were widely drawn, but the precise mixture is local and unique. The other major early Iron Age site on Ithaca, the Polis Cave, has long been interpreted as a hero shrine to Odysseus, at least from the 8th century onwards, and seen from an outsider perspective as frequented chiefly by sailors before the opening of the Lefkas Canal, when shipping, as we saw, would naturally have run down the Ithaca Channel. Indeed, our very slight evidence for early Iron Age pre-colonial settlement on Lefkas consists of a shrine in the vicinity of Khortata, on the west of the island, which has produced small Bronze Age uh, pendants similar to those from Ayatos. Unfortunately, these were sold to dirt faults, so we don't have an excavation context for them. And a um, pithos burial at Sivros, just inland from Vasiliki, both pointing to communication along this western route. So it is reasonable to assume foreign visitors at Polis. And the Xenos inscription that I mentioned earlier of around 700 from Ayatos points in the same direction. Indeed, to digress for just one moment, this inscription is of considerable interest. A long, probably hexameter text runs in a downward spiral around, the long ne around a long-necked conical inocui, decorated on the base with an image of the vessel, of a vessel of the same shape. Only the first part of the text is now preserved and or legible, and it refers to a xenos te philos ke pistos hetaros, a friend, a guest friend, a friend, and a faithful companion, combining formulae attested in the early poets in Homer and Theognis. Key parts of the text, including the main verb, unfortunately, are lost, so we can't be sure of the formula being used. But this is a vessel used for consumption, for serving, uh, as a host might treat a friend or companion, the specific importance of which is reinforced by the drawing on the base. And it's a vessel which was literally wrapped round with an expression of social ties in a verse form closely linked to incantation. And it's dedicated in a ritual context strongly associated with a celebration of personal or family status. The interplay between the power of writing, the oral formula, and the nature of the object and the context of its use recalls other vessels like Home Nestor's Cup from Pithecusae. But it's interesting to see Xenia given such political prominence at Iotos. To return then to Polis, external explanation should not be overrated. There is a powerful long-term local story, especially when one considers all the evidence. The 1930s site publications, while models of their time, 
include almost no post-archaic material and omit certain categories of artefacts, like cooking pots, which give a very clear picture of changing practices. And this was one of the factors that led the British School to return to the site in 2002 to make a new reconstruction of the physical feature and to place all the objects found by period within it to look at deposition and site formation processes. In fact, we reconstruct an open rock shelter oriented towards the Stavros Ridge and accessible by land from it. With the Rosano Acropolis above it, one of the most northerly points visible from Ayatos, the shrine could serve both areas with, as a marker of the ruler's authority. By the second half of the 6th century, our earliest inscription from the site refers to the peripoloi, the surrounders of the deities worshipped, Athena and Hera. Although we do not know what form this group took, and indeed Northern Ithaca has produced only very slight evidence for early Iron Age settlement, and then from around 700 onwards. The picture changes markedly only from the later 7th century. In pre-classical times, before the, polis, before the polis sanctuary came to follow the general Greek trend for simpler, lower-value votives, especially figurines, the material record, I think, suggests an island-wide strategy. Since there is some overlap with Iotos, mostly in pottery shapes, but there's also a significant complementarity in the votives offered at the two shrines. Personal ornament, figurative iconography, and small bronzes are more evident at Iotos, with monumental metal dedications, tripods and armour, largely confined to polis. Together, the two assemblages are typical of wider trends in votive behaviour in Western Greece. And I think the famous tripod dedications must be understood within this longer history rather than as the key to identifying the cult. Given the strong external links of some offerings, three of the tripods seem to have been produced from moulds used at Olympia, and they retain traces of their clay investment, which we've just sampled for analysis, it's impossible to prove that the Ithacusian elite were entirely responsible for the form of the shrine, but I think there is a very strong argument to be made for this. It's also likely that the same Olympian deities were worshipped at both sites. The polis inscription confirms the worship of Athena Polius, the earliest hint of a polis on the island, and of Hera. Both are tentatively identified at Iotos too, although Hera's epithet of polis, Telea, implies a role in protecting marriage, which is slightly at odds with her slightly more lively image that we find at uh, Iotos in this iconography. Artemis images form the great majority of Hellenistic figurines at Polis and are also found at Iotos. An inscribed sacred law reported by William Gell in the 19th century as found at Vathi refers to a precinct of Artemis. The stone may have been removed from Iotos, as was so much construction material, but it's tempting to link it to a coastal shrine identified by tiles and architectural ter terracottas found on the beach at Brosta Iotos, and that's likely the origin of part of a terracotta statue found by the BSA before the Second World War. <coughs> it's no great leap to associate the worship of Odysseus with that of his patron, Athena, and the epi epithet Polius strengthens the political impact. But there's no clear indication of when he moved from being the model votary to being a recipient of cult. Aristotle's Constitution of the Ithacesians, uh, which we know from Plutarch, refers to an annual recompense of barley, wine, honeycombs, olive oil, salt, and adult animals paid to Telemachus by the Ithacesians. This looks like a ritual practice linked to a hero, but we don't know the practicalities or how far back it predated the fourth century. However, it is clear that this pivotal location of the shrine relevant to both south and north, made it liable to changes in emphasis over time. And whereas in the south there is only a small archaic temple at Iotos, plus the coastal shrine and a spectacular classical cave of the nymphs at Dexia, in the north there is no secure evidence for any other sanctuary before the establishment of a late Hellenistic or Roman shrine at Dias Athanasius. So the early Iron Age record of Ithaca is exceptionally rich and with all due caution, given hints of centres on Kefalonia, the island may be the epicentre of the archipelago at this point. The lack of a cemetery before about 700 is a puzzle, but here's some very new evidence from Meganisi may give a clue. Now, as I noted, survey evidence indicates substantial settlement in the Mili area 
on the Bronze Age Iron Age transition, and again going down in late geometric to early archaic. There may be continuity, but we need to do more work on the pottery. We were reading this only a month before I came out from Austra for Australia, so it is really quite new. But colleagues in the archaeological service have just in the past few months excavated a series of burials, including a spectacular transitional warrior grave, in the kinds of stone piles which we tended to dismiss as farmers' field clearances. Uh, and these extend right down the southern leg of the island. In the case of the Mili one, local tradition marked it out as a monument. Uh, it actually carried the folk name Tokomnima, the Turkish monument. But perhaps we need, I think, to be a little bit more curious about our stone piles in general. We're rather groaning at this. Uh, we were walking past them in the fields on Ithaca. I think we need to start taking them apart. The, major ch uh, the picture changes from later archaic times onwards, with major and very different changes occurring at the two pole islands, Lefkas and Kevlinia. The colony founded by Corinth on the new site of Lefkas around 625 had by the early 5th century become extremely prosperous. It was able to send three triremes to the Battle of Salamis, and along with its sister colony, Anactorium, 800 hoplites to Plataea. The source of its wealth and of the development of Lefkas as a commercial centre combining agriculture and mercantile trade was a six kilometre long canal opened by the Corinthians soon after colonisation, which gave a safer passage between the Adriatic and the Corinthian Gulf than that around the west coast. Although given the recurrent silting which frequently closed the canal, the western route was never entirely abandoned. The South Harbour Mole, which linked Lefkas with the mainland, at 8 to 10 metres wide and over 600 metres long, one of the largest such constructions in Greece, secured the commercial dock and the protected anchorage and guaranteed a basic maritime outlet for the mainland coast, which was otherwise rather hard to pass by land, although in turn, as I've said, this created a need to secure the Perea. Pottery, especially amphorae on the mole, dates from the classical period to the 6th century after Christ. Thereafter, the mole was submerged. The date of its construction remains unknown, although since it lies outside the city wall, as you see, it's tempting to suggest that it predates the construction of the wall going back to the very early years of the colony. The creation of the port left the east coast as the centre of settlement on the island. The polis town extended along the narrow section of the straits in planned insulae, containing houses, workshops and agricultural facilities which expanded steadily into the Hellenistic period. A bridge over the straits is partially preserved and attested also in an inscription. The second major settlement centre lay to the south on the same coast, in and around the Nidri Plain, and here you see some of the material, graves from the archaic period onwards, again housing expanded into the Hellenistic period, uh, with towers in the wider plain too. And indeed, it's the spread of agricultural tower residences into the upland plains, which confirms the harnessing of the island's economy in, out to this commercial outlet. Fifteen of these towers have so far been found in the uplands and in the south at Castri. And this also provides the context for the rise of polis along the Acarnanian coast, uh, just slightly off the image in the south at Iniave, the big docklands, uh, dock centre, Astakos, Alusia, and Paleros, where fortifications and harbour works were built, plus sanctuaries. At the top of the image, there's the 4th century Drimon shrine of Artemis in the territory of Alusia, just overlooking the coast. And then uh, I've put some of the pottery from the British excavations at um, Astakos, which you see in the middle image, uh, just from Sylvia Benton's notebook uh, on the bottom. The best anchorage were indeed, it was indeed in the Bay of Astakos, where the first signs of post-prehistoric activity are found in this late 6th, early 5th century layer in the, the cave at Asnicolis. In general, until the 4th century, coastal Acarnania was largely self-sufficient. Thereafter, you get a, a rich trading economy swiftly developing, carrying on through the 4th and 3rd centuries. Kefalonia presents a very different picture with a steady process of city-state definition from the late 6th century onwards. Border forts begin to appear in the Archaic period, and while polis centres were not fortified until the later 5th century at the earliest, temple building began in the 6th century. And where preserved, the architectural reference and the imports at these temple sites 
are very widely drawn, from Kerkula on the northern Adriatic down to the Peloponnese. By the early 5th century, the polis status of Pale is reflected in the dispatch of 200 hoplites to Plataea in 479, and in its city coinage. Silver is then struck at Crani around 500 and 450, and at all four cities of the Tetrapolis around 400. The imagery chosen both unites and distinguishes the city. Cephalus and his wife Procris are ubiquitous, but where deities are depicted, they differ. Pali choosing Demeter and Cori, as you see, Crani and Sami, Apollo and Artemis, and Prony, Heracles and Zeus. So Odysseus is on none of this. He's purely Ithacesian. Uh, this is the different mythology of the Cephalonian cities. From the 450s onwards, Athens expanded its political influence in the West, effectively subjugating Zakynthos and Cephalonia, capturing Aetolian Chalcis, and settling the Messenians from Ithome at Naphactus. The Cephalonian polis mostly allied with Athens as her conflicts with the Peloponnesians developed. And I'll pass over the long story of subsequent Athenian military and diplomatic action in the wider region, a region which traditionally had stronger Corinthian connections, and focus simply on the material implications. Athenian influence in city planning and fortification grew from the mid-5th century into the early 4th, although most of these projects were not completed. The Mycenaean fortification at Krani, with its Dipilon-style gate, is a case in point, probably completed by the Macedonian kings. The second major period of coinage around 375, with silver emissions from Pali, as we've just seen, Sami and Proni, more or less coincides with heavy Athenian tax impositions. And the beginning of intensive settlement in the Pilaros Valley, north of Sami, may indeed be due to Aetolian colonists, we have a nice inscription of 223 in the main Aetolian sanctuary at Thermon, setting out laws of property and inheritance specifically for these colonists on Cavalignan. So what impact did the contrasting patterns of development on Lefkas and Cavalignan have on the rest of the archipelago? Well, Ithaca, for one, was simply pulled in two directions. Materially, the north drew steadily closer to Lefkas. In both north and south, Archaic to early classical pottery shapes of broadly Peloponnesian, especially Corinthian derivation, were retained well into the Hellenistic period. But although Attic and Peloponnesian imports continued to circulate around the island, as the 5th century progressed, they came to be more congregated in the south, with Acarnanian, Aetolian and local red figure and black glaze more popular in the north. Settlement in the north also expanded from the late 7th century onwards. By the 4th century, Stavros was substantial. Here you see one of the newly excavated 4th century retaining walls which defined the settlement, with scattered graves roughly aligned to the south. Oops. Beside, sorry, I didn't want to do that. The south, oops, get rid of that. Beside the modern road uh, from Polis Bay, a line which continued in use. Uh, this tomb monument, which you see being excavated in 2003, in fact destroyed an early 3rd century grave. And then to the north, broadly following the route between Stavros and Aes Athanasius via Pilicata, with additional graves on the slope below Platrithias. Many grave stelae, many of the late 4th to early 5th centuries BC, have been discovered built into structures in the surrounding villages. Now, in our discussion of Ithaca in the early Iron Age, we were considering a period of low resident population and high maritime dependency. Now the situation is reversed, and we've got intensive exploitation of the landscape from the end of the classical period for an external market. Survey data show that the slopes around Stavros were heavily used with extra urban construction in the Polis Valley and a steady extension of the settlement chain north along the Pilicata Ridge towards Aes Athanasius. No evidence of ancient terracing was found in our survey, even though other kinds of structures, like this Hellenistic house wall and indeed the funerary monument we just saw, were adapted into modern terrace lines. These structures must have stood on cultivated but largely unterraced valley slopes, leading us to investigate the possibility that anthropogenic slope erosion actually started at that time, and in fact we think it did. The Tau system on Lefkas was also linked visually through Ithaca to northern Kefalonia. 
on Ithaca, the earliest towers in the Ayatollah upper and lower fortification systems, date around the end of the 4th century. Slightly later, a smaller tower to Athanasius, built some 50 years after the resumption of settlement here in the third quarter of the 4th century, is the best Ithacesian candidate for an agricultural tower residence like those on Levkas. The fortification on the Rosano Acropolis of Bogpolis, which again is just about 50 years, 50 to 100 years later than the resumption of settlement in the Upland Valley behind it, as you see, provides the critical visual link between Ayas Athanasius, the Upland Plains, Stavros, and Ayatos. Occupation of areas like this marked the start of systematic exploitation of these uplands, probably for herding in tandem with lowland cultivation. The strength of this northwards pull is illustrated both epigraphically and archaeologically. In the first quarter of the second century BC, Ithaca first appears in the Delphic catalogue of Theodorki, those magistracies city by city, magistrates who received Delphi's envoys announcing the Pythian games. But it appears as part of a northwestern Greek route, involving also Kerkula, Lefkas, and Akanania, not as an adjunct to the southern route that involves the four cities on Kefalonia, which is listed quite separately in the inscription. Both the Peloponnesian and the northern routes were already in place by the late 4th century, though in theory Ithaca could have been added to either. The choice of the north is reflecting the proximity of contemporary ties. Archaeologically, I note also the rapid growth in settlement at Ayas Athanasius, which soon overtook Stavros. An initial excavation campaign by the British School in 1930 sampled an area of some 50 hectares, revealing Hellenistic and early to Middle Roman settlement remains. A second season in 1937 focused on the smaller area around the tower and the terraces beneath again producing important settlement remains dating at least into the 3rd century AD. So we know a lot about the town's date and extent and its material culture, but not in the details of its planning or its very specific diachronic development. Both northern Ithaca, Stavros and Ayas Athanasius, and Iotos in the south have produced exceptionally wealthy Hellenistic burials, with a range of luxury imports, including for the first time imported Italian pottery and jewellery. In the north, new graves are still being found, but overall, much evidence comes from the work of early 19th century travellers and from the concentrations of largely reused gravestones. But while elite luxury was shared across the island, the ordinary domestic assemblages of Ayas Athanasius are, on present evidence, by far the most varied. Imported tablewares include Megarian bowls from Ephesus to Epirus, glazed wares from Mytilene, and some Italian black glaze. There's also evidence of experiment with so-called Roman decorative techniques, including double dipping shapes, which are Corinthian in tradition and sometimes reaching back into the archaic period. The most complete example on top right is cotterly from a late third century with a cotterly shape with later west third, later third century west slope decoration. Gosh, it's difficult to say. Uh, mostly comes from a neighboring grave. It's a very curious uh, fusion indeed. Most general comparison with Iotos remains very impressionistic given the very different focuses of excavation. The British school campaigns here focused on the sanctuary within the red box and the Hellenistic tower with trials beside the fortification walls and the harbour at Piso Iotos. Classical and Hellenistic houses on and around the saddle below the hill were subsequently excavated by Washington University. But the lower slopes of the Acropolis, on which streets and house walls are clearly visible, have yet to be fully investigated. Unfortunately, the Cairns excavation was simply in the wrong place to document the city's expansion. To judge from the lines of the walls and the surface remains on the lower slopes, plus tombs excavated in the 19th century, Iotos must have been a large and prosperous late classical and Hellenistic town, predictably so if it mirrors contemporary Sami over the straits, which by this point had grown to be the leading city on Kefalonia. There are some signs of a shared material culture, especially in the ceramic repertoire. And while more work is needed to document this fully, it's clear that there's a local pattern of connection distinct from that observed in the north. On the smaller islands too, survey data show that the main peaks of activity date to the later classical Hellenistic, 
late Roman and then early modern periods. Exploitation for herding or small-scale cash cropping occurred in quite clear and discrete phases. Meganisi at least had a more stable local population as we've seen with near continuous settlement in the south, but these peak periods are also evident in the spread of activity across the countryside. Given the likely scale of the market for produce on left class in particular, it's easy to see why the classical to Hellenistic boom happened. But who was cultivating and on what basis is less clear. The Venetian and later boom was seasonal and driven from Ithaca in particular, given the constraints on local resources, and also from left class. The parallel with this recent history is inviting, if rather speculative. So turning finally to the rise and decline of Roman power in the area, certain overarching similarities in the material record again conceal contrasting experiences on left class and Kefalonia. Before Augustus's final defeat of Mark Antony and his foundation of his victory city at Nicopolis in 31 BC, which reduced Lefkas and the other Acarnanian cities to dependencies, Lefkas, as capital of the Acarnanian League, had a long history of engagement with Rome and almost certainly had Italian residents. Livy attributes Flamininus's success in besieging Lefkas in 197 after it refused to accede to Rome to the treachery of the exiled Italians who lived there. The impact of the siege is clear, for example, in the violent destruction of a commercial building by the port and in building inscriptions which indicate at least partial reconstruction, probably of the walls. Lefkas retained its role in the Acarnanian Kinon until the Battle of Pydna in 168, when Thurian became the, the seat. And Lefkas was granted independence as a Civitas Libera, minting its own coinage, a situation which lasted until the foundation of Nicopolis. Although Strabo says that the establishment of Nicopolis left Nefkas and the other Acarnanian cities deserted, Eremia, it's clear that the city and some rural sites were settled into the 4th century after Christ. Eremia rather means the loss of a certain kind of civic life. The port continued in use through the 5th century AD, reflecting the central importance of the sea route linking Nicopolis with Patras and Corinth. However, there seems to be a shift towards wealthy Roman landowners controlling agricultural production. Settlement of the intramural urban area continued in some form, at least until the first century AD. But it's likely that gradual decline and desertion began early. And elsewhere, there's at least one early, early Roman grave dug among deserted Hellenistic houses. The South Cemetery was abandoned, with only the northernmost part of the North Cemetery remaining in use for burials and to a more limited extent than that in the Hellenistic period. Roman burials of the first to third centuries scattered through the cemetery, either reusing classical or Hellenistic cysts or in new tile graves, probably relate to a large first to second century farmhouse or agricultural complex. As you see here, founded between the city walls and the cemetery. And this fits a pattern of rural residences established along the coast of Epirus and Acarnania from the first century BC onwards. We know of at least one family, the Corsini family from Puteoli, who are among the Italian landowners who settled along the Iperate coast at this time, as well as on left Cass. A similar picture is found at Nidri, where there's extensive evidence of Roman settlement, water management, and burials, including a cemetery of tile graves into the 4th or 5th century after Christ at Stenon, the site of the very famous Bronze Age cemetery. In the absence of extensive architectural remains to go with these graves, it's likely that this too represents rural agricultural installations. And there are further scattered remains, especially in the south. You see here the ancient, probably Roman temple beneath the church of Ias Janus Rodakis at Vunica. Kefalonia too was strategically significant. In 189, following Roman patrols against Kefalonian pirates, cutting off trade down the straits, the consul Marcus Favilius Nobilio crossed to the island and demanded 20 hostages each from Pali, Crani and Sami. Sami revolted and fell after a four month siege in 188. The Samians were sold as slaves and a Roman gar garrison installed. In general on the island, settlement changes were sharp. Survey data show a shift from numerous higher lying sites before the first half of the second century BC to a fewer lower lying Roman sites 
including the coastal villas of the late Republican and Imperial periods, other, those as we see at Scala, Catocatelios, and Pali. At Crani, the late Hellenistic and early Roman industrial quarter produced stamped amphorae to ship local produce. Sami shows some similarities with Lefkas in its development after the sack, although with rather more evidence of continuing Roman and especially port life. Uh, the Roman city plan, in fact, extends from the top of the modern town down towards the plain and right along the shore, with no indication that intramural settlement was abandoned. The harbour gets considerable new installations at Luthron, while on the shore, parts of the commercial centre, as you see, bottom left, have been excavated. And we have a number of baths which remain in use for long periods. There's as yet little evidence for the architecture of simple private houses, although several large residences and at least two public buildings had floor mosaics, as you see. The major development on the island was the foundation of Panamos in the far north at the modern Fiscadro, which fast became the richest settlement on the island, physically and politically closest to Nicopolis. Inscriptions on bases surrounding the Roman agora provide inf information on office holders, religious beliefs, and personal names. And the last two lines on one in particular place the citizens of Panamos in direct political relationship with the Emperor Hadrian. Other monuments excavated through the modern town include vaulted mausolea, parts of a theater or a theon, and a small bath complex almost next to the cemetery on the Bay of Ayas Andreas. In many ways, the city feels like an insertion into the island system with wider external connections than evident elsewhere. And there are certainly big differences in its material culture. As one very small example, we're currently completing an analytical program on coarse and cookware fabrics, a diachronic development between Kefalonia and Ithaki. And analysis of these fabrics indicates that unlike Sami or Ayas Athanasius, very few of the samples from Panamos are local. Are local. They're importing all over, and in particular from across Italy. In comparison with the Hellenistic period, early imperial Ithaca appears to have been a backwater with no distinctive role. The northern trade routes were particularly important after the establishment of Nicopolis and Panamos, and indeed only Ayas Athanasius and a new coastal site at Ayas Iorgos opposite Panamos uh, have pottery closely datable to the late 1st century BC or early 1st AD, both tableware and, as you see here, the particularly distinctive Campalian amphorae. The externally imposed Augustan pattern of control negated local identity. The decline of the shrine in the Polis Cave was probably a direct result. Only four years before Actium in 35 BC, the freedman Epaphroditus, who was an ungrant salesman, had left an inscribed dedication there. But that's almost the last call. Thereafter, the sanctuary declines very rapidly through the early Roman period, with no uh, subsequent revival. At Ayas Athanasius, the ceramic assemblage offers valuable insights into local consumption of Roman material culture. The fine wares include a few examples of Aretine and Eastern Sigillata A from Patras workshops. But Roman-style tablewares mostly consists of a few plate and platter forms made somewhere in the coastal zone from Kefalonia to Kekira and beyond into the Adriatic. Exactly how many workshops were located within this area and where is unknown. There's no direct evidence of production on Ithaca. A tile kiln excavated in 1938 in Polis Bay is likely early Roman, but there are no wasters to indicate that other ceramic products were fired here. This isn't an unusual picture in rural Greece, where uptake of sigillata shapes was often limited and plates and platters generally more popular. But it's perhaps surprising to find it in such a previously well-connected area. To judge from the cookpots, culinary practices stayed resolutely Greek, at least until the late 1st or early 2nd century AD, as they did in southern Epirus and the, along the Acarnanian coast. But activity was not confined to the north. From the later 1st and 2nd centuries AD, there was considerable activity at the deep water harbour in Vathi. As you see here, we've got a number of tomb groups and a Roman to late Roman complex with a domestic shrine and adjacent baths. And we think also we have a continuation at Ayatos. Well, the story ends with what is now emerging as a rather complicated set of changes flowing from the decline and then very sharp contraction of Nicopolis and its trade networks 
after the third century AD. Predictably, Lefkas was hit hardest, with very, very little evidence post-dating the third century. Later on, in the seventh and eighth centuries after Christ, we start to find some monumental construction, but on the island as a whole, this period remains ill-understood. The situation is rather better further south along the Acarnanian coast. At Astakos, for example, dense and extensive late Roman and early Christian building remains in the Bay of, of Aios Pantelimon, some 200 meters west of the ancient settlement, include a probable basilica with a floor, fourth century floor mosaic partially submerged in the sea. And I'm sorry about the quality of this image. But more generally, the decline of Nicopolis had a strong centrifugal effect with population moving out to marginal areas around and beyond the old political borders. This is strikingly clear on Meganisi, where usually low-density scatters of late Roman coarse and cooking wares were found across much of the area surveyed, including now the north of the island, a rather different pattern to the previous Hellenistic peak. Other islands, too, have produced pottery, with building remains also on both Castos and Calamos. How long this phenomenon lasted in the small islands is at present unclear. Our initial reading of the Meganisi pottery suggests a gap after late Roman until the 7th century AD. But late Roman is itself an imprecise notion when you're dealing with surface pottery, and it's still rather early on in the study. Kefalonia and Ithaki, in particular together, enjoyed a major late Roman revival. Panormos remained an important center. In addition to the 6th century basilica on the Carvus Promontory, a 5th to 6th century complex with a hearth and storeroom has recently been excavated in the Agora area. But while the sources from the 6th century onward sometimes use Panormos as a shorthand for the whole island, the archaeological picture is much richer. At Sami, an early Byzantine house complex with associated burials, was founded on Hellenistic remains in the area of the Roman port. And a three-hour basilica with a floor mosaic in the nave and an associated cemetery, as you see here, was built, built in the west part of the modern town. And at Krani, there's at least one public building plus extensive early Byzantine complexes by the sea, which must be harbour installations. On both islands, survey data allow us to move beyond the old town centres to document rural settlement in both lowlands and uplands, which led gradually to the development of the complex upland systems that characterised the medieval and early Venetian record. This is not a flight to the hills. It's a gradual shift of focus to the uplands after several centuries of exploiting the uplands and the lowlands together. Northern Ithaca illustrates this well. Uh, considerable activity in the Polis Island and the Polis Valley is shown by surface remains as well as a dump of 5th to 7th century tableware and amphorae, which confirms that the island remained widely connected. And this is combined with a marked growth around Rosano and the associated uplands. The sense that these islands were moving back together and more firmly into a northwestern milieu is reflected in their political status. During the 7th century, Kefalonia was part of the province of Hellas or Achaea, and Ithaca was in Pallia Iperos. By the 8th century, Ithaca, Kefalonia, and indeed Zakynthos were all part of proti so they moved up politically northwards. Rusano, its name, a corruption of Jerusalem, was to become one of the island's most significant medieval landmarks. So I end this long story of island history with the account of the Byzantine chronicler, Anna Comnina, that the name derived from the vision of Roberto Giscard, Duke of Apulia and Calabria, and conqueror of Kefalonia, who in 1085 had a vision of the holy city on the mountain over the water as he lay dying in the town renamed for him, Viscardo. So, thank you. <laughs> That's really